Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. We are wrapping up March. We've had a crazy month, over 30 live events for classrooms to join into and meet scientists and explorers and conservationists from around the world. And as we always do it here, we are going out uh, with a big ending to the month. We still actually have a couple more events before March ends. Uh, plus, we've added most of our April events to the website now. So if you visit exploringbytheseat.com, you can find the events that we do have coming up. And of course, register to jump in camera spots or to tune in live or later uh, via our YouTube channel. So we have an awesome event today. I'm so excited. First time we have Christine Wilkinson joining us. She is a conservation biologist, a carnivore ecologist, and a National Geographic explorer. So she's currently based at the University uh, of California in Berkeley and has just returned from doing some field work in Kenya. She's interested in how large predators interact with ecosystems, with people and their landscapes. Particularly, uh, she does some work with spotted hyenas and she looks to integrate a variety of community perspectives to ensure that there's lasting and socially just environmental outcomes between uh, predators uh, and in the communities that they do live around. So I'm going to bring Christine in live with us right now. Hey, Christine, how are you doing today? Doing great. Hi, y'all. Awesome. Well, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We've got a great group of classrooms on camera. We're going to meet some of them shortly for some Q&A action. Uh, we've got a great group tuning in via YouTube, a few classrooms, one in Waterloo, another one in the grade sixes in Ottawa are saying hi. So keep those greetings coming in the chat. For now, Christine, I'm going to let you take over for a bit, and then uh, we'll hit you with some Q&A action. Awesome. Sounds good. Uh, can we see my screen? Yeah, looks good. I'm just popping in the presentation. We're Fantastic. ready. Fantastic. Okay, everyone. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm Dr. Christine Wilkinson, uh, and as Joe said, I am a National Geographic Explorer and a carnivore ecologist based at UC Berkeley in California. Um, so my research is about spotted hyenas and other carnivores and how they move and behave in places where people live. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about just a little bit of what I do, and then try to leave some room at the end to tell you a little bit how I became a carnivore ecologist in case any of you folks are interested in becoming a carnivore ecologist. So, oops. So let me start you off with something I think a lot of us don't really realize, and that is that large carnivores and other wildlife live alongside people in even the most really remote landscapes. So I've included a photo here at the bottom right of a leopard amongst a bunch of tourist vehicles in a place called Masai Mara National Park in Kenya. And that is a big remote national park. But even there, the leopards are basically hiding behind the tourist vehicles to try and hunt more easily. So even in these places that we might think, oh, we're not interacting with carnivores, we actually are. And of course those interactions are more and more serious in places um, where we share landscapes with them more frequently. So today, um, although I work on a lot of carnivores, I actually wanna talk about spotted hyenas in particular, because I think that they are really neat and some of you may have some misunderstandings about them and they're very close to my heart. So we'll talk a lot about hyenas and communities um, for the next 15 or so minutes, and then I'll tell you about my career path. So how many of you have seen this movie? If you're in your classroom, raise your hand if you've seen this movie. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have. If you haven't, it's The Lion King. So I really love The Lion King, but there's one reason that I don't like it. Those of you who have seen the movie might have noticed that the hyenas seen here are the bad guys in the movie. And in the movie, they're shown as evil and they're trying to take over Simba's home. You might have noticed that they're also kind of portrayed as being dumb in the movie, like Ed on the right there. Um, but I am here today to tell you that the cartoon hyenas in The Lion King are almost nothing like hyenas in real life. Real life hyenas are very smart. They have awesome teamwork and they care for their families. And by the end today, I hope I can convince you that hyenas are actually cooler than lions. So what are hyenas? They look like bears, cats, dogs combined. Uh, in your classroom, how many of you think that hyenas are most closely related to dogs? Raise your hand. 
Now raise your hand if you think that hyenas are more like cats. I'm hearing some some feedback, so if folks can make sure they're muted, that would be good. So the answer is that turns out they're actually more like cats than they are like dogs or bears. So scientists use something that is really similar to like a family tree to help us to organize which animals are more like each other. So just like you are more closely related to your sister or your brother than you are related to your cousins. So on this branch of the cladogram or family tree are all the animals that are the most like cats. It's called feliformia. And so that includes things like your house cat and lions and civets and uh, meerkats like Timon from the Lion King, but it also includes hyenas. And hyenas, um, actually there are four species of hyenas, although we're only talking about spotted hyenas today. And then on that other branch are all of the dog-like animals like bears and skunks and dogs and seals and others. So now when your friends and family say that hyenas look like dogs, you can tell them that hyenas are actually more closely related to your pet cat. So let's talk a little bit about hyena families. So spotted hyenas are very social. Just like us, they live in family groups and they really care for their families, which are called clans. They're also what we call matrilineal, which means that the females are the boss. The females rule everything, they take care of the clans, they stay with their female relatives for their whole lives, and the males have to move out and find another clan. And they also have really special social ranks in hyena clans. For example, if you are the number one female in the clan, it's like you're the queen. And that really high rank gets passed down to your cubs just because they are related to you. And then that means that all of the males in the clan are typically ranked lower than all the females. Sorry, guys. Girl power. So to study the clans, I drive up to their den where they hide out and I watch them. And sometimes they can get tricky. So you can see this little guy up here in the right is trying to chew on my car's tires. And they also have a tendency to chew on brake lines and get into other mischief. Um, and that's partly because they're very, very smart. So they're very curious. So research has shown that they are actually as good or even better at problem solving than chimpanzees are. Um, so pretty, pretty smart. So since these animals are so social, they communicate in many different ways. So they use their body language and their voices to send messages to their clan, just like I'm using my hands to express myself here and showing excitement in my voice as I talk with you all. Um, and we're going to listen to two of the many different sounds that hyenas make to talk with each other. So this first sound, hopefully you can hear it, is going to be called a whoop. So listen closely because we're all going to try and make a whoop in a second. Sorry, teachers. So here's the whoop. didn't come through for us, Christine. I wonder, uh -oh. can, can you try um, and unplug the, the headphone and maybe we can catch it over the speaker? All right, let's give it a try. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we still got you. All right, let's try this way. You heard it? Yep, that came through. All right, I'll, I'll do it one more time. Okay, so let's see if I can stop this. I can't. Okay, so uh, that whoop is used to call other hyenas over. So maybe if there's something good to eat, for example, and in the wild, you can hear a hyena whoop from many, many miles away. So let's all give it a try. Practice your whoops. You got to lower your head and you got to bring it up and let out the whoop. So I'll give you an example. Okay, so give it a try. Sounding good, sounding good. All right, all right. Okay, now we're going to stop. So if you were a hyena, you'd be calling your clan over to you with your whoops. And sometimes the babies actually try to do a whoop and they sound really funny and they kind of like mess it up. So I've heard a lot of babies that sound kind of like this. And like kind of scream at the end. So it's pretty funny. Um, and then the second call I want to play for you, hopefully you'll be able to hear it again through my screen, is the giggle. So hyenas are really famous for this. Um, I'll give it a go. Hopefully you heard that. I'll do, I'll do it one more time, just in case. Mm 
Did I get it? Yeah, it came through. Awesome. Okay, so that sounds a lot like laughing, right? So it's, they're pretty famous for that sound and they make that sound when they're excited or when they feel threatened. And in fact, I use both of those sounds um, when I'm trying to capture a spotted hyena. I have a speaker that I put up and I call them in using those sounds and that's how we end up capturing them. Um, I'm gonna put my headphones back in just because I wanna be able to hear y'all properly when we chat. Can you still hear me, Joe? Yeah, it, it clicked over well. We still got gotcha. you. Awesome. Okay, moving on. Um, so in order to study hyenas and all of their complex behaviors, we actually really need to be able to tell them apart from one another. Um, so how do we know who's who? Well, each spotted hyena has a unique spot pattern, just like all of us have a unique fingerprint pattern. So to tell the hyenas apart, um, I have them all in a book with photographs of the right and left side of their bodies. And many of the hyenas in the place where I work have a distinct pattern on their shoulder that's very similar to each other. So even though the overall spat patterns are different, there might be some patterns that are very similar when the hyenas are related, just like you might have similar eyes or hair or smile that looks like your parents and your siblings. So among other things, hyenas use their complex communication skills to hunt. So even though the Lion King shows hyenas as being scavengers, eating already dead things, or stealing food from the lions, it's actually usually the other way around. Lions are actually more likely to steal food from hyenas. So hyenas hunt and kill most of their food. They're apex predators, just like lions are, which means they're at the very top of the food chain. And I've included a picture here. Um, one of the things we do when we capture them is a bunch of measurements, including measurements of their teeth to see how healthy they're doing. And also if their teeth are kind of worn down, you can check out um, how, how old they are. You can make an estimate of their age. So these animals, they eat things like gazelles, wildebeest, zebra, warthogs, buffalo, and more. And sometimes because they're so clever, they even eat unexpected things. Um, so one of my mentors, whose name is Kay Holacamp, once saw hyenas that looked like they were eating grass. But when she got closer, they were actually licking caterpillars off of the grass and eating them. Um, but hyenas also do scavenge. And we know now that they clean up diseases in the environment by eating all of the carcasses in the environment. So they're actually really helpful for human public health. And that's something that I'm working on in the future to try and connect um, people with hyenas. So they're very resourceful. Now, I bet you've been wondering what that picture is on the right side. It's actually spotted hyena poop. And the poop is often pure white because hyenas can digest bone and the calcium in the bone makes the poop white. They're one of the few species that are able to digest bone in the whole world. Um, they have one of the strongest bite forces in the entire animal kingdom, up to a thousand pounds per square inch. Um, so take a second to look at this image of hyena skulls over time as they get older. Think about what changes you see. So if you look at the top of the skull, you can see that that ridge of bone called a sagittal crest gets a lot taller. You can also see that those parts on the cheek area called zygomatic arches get a lot thicker and wider. And these two parts of the skull are the easiest way to see that hyenas have huge jaw muscles. So the zygomatic arches on the cheek are wide enough for those huge muscles to go through and then attached to that really tall sagittal crest to have all that muscle attached to it. So basically, hyenas are really good at chewing and biting, and they're actually called the bone crushers for a reason. Uh, so how do I study hyenas? Um, some of the main tools I use are camera traps. So the one on the bottom left uh, is a camera trap, a motion sense camera that basically when an animal walks by, it takes picture or video, and I'll show you one of those in a second. Uh, I use GPS collars, uh, which basically, of course, we put on the animal's neck and are, we're able to use the GPS to track them. And then I use participatory mapping with community members. So that's basically having communities involved in the research and they can draw their experiences on the map with where they're seeing hyenas, where they've experienced conflict with the hyenas, that kind of thing. So a quick warning, on the next slide, you're gonna see some carcasses with some blood. Nature is messy. I'm gonna keep it real with y'all. Um, so not only do hyenas eat wild animals, they also sometimes eat domestic animals like cows and sheep for an easy snack. So if any of you have chickens or goats or other pets, you can imagine how scary it would be to worry about your animals or your pets being eaten. So where I work, some people put up special cow pens like these in this picture to keep the hyenas and the other carnivores out. Um, and hyenas attacking livestock like cows and sheep is just one part of what we like to call human carnivore conflict, which I work on a lot. 
But conflict also includes how people feel about the carnivores that live near them. Are they afraid of those carnivores? It also includes whether people retaliate against carnivores. So maybe killing the carnivores by poisoning them. Um, so it's really important that we understand and solve these conflicts working with communities and listening to people in a meaningful way. So for my research, um, we actually involve the communities in this process um, and we use a tool called participatory mapping that I mentioned earlier to really understand how people see their surroundings and how they're experiencing that relationship with hyenas and other carnivores. And in these sessions with people, basically we interview them and then we use, uh, we have people use a map to draw their experiences with things like um, their livestock getting killed by carnivores or where they're afraid to go because hyenas and other carnivores are in those parts of the landscape or maybe where they think hyenas and other carnivores should be able to live on the landscape. And then we make those paper maps into digital maps to use for the research. So this tool really got communities involved in the research and they let us hear what these people think is important for conserving hyenas, which is of course the most important part because they live with the hyenas. So even though we think of animals like hyenas and lions living free and roaming around the landscape, there are of course a lot of places where they live side by side with people. So this photo is from the national park in Kenya where I work called Lake Nakuru National Park. And there's a really tall, mostly electric fence surrounding the entire park as you can see in this picture. And a big reason that it's there is to try and stop human wildlife conflict. So can you imagine if every park or natural area you went to had a fence around the whole thing? That is like a huge amount of work to maintain. But the fence is there to help with conflict and to protect people from animals and to protect the animals from people. But the fences might also be affecting the ecology and sort of the wildlife behavior because wildlife want to move through these fences and get out. Um, so we wanted to study this. And so part of the work that I do is we put up these motion sense cameras like this one. This one's actually um, has been broken by a bird called a hornbill. Really went at it for like an hour. But just to show you the camera and the really sturdy metal box we put it in to see how the animals are behaving around the fences. And we do all sorts of things around the fences, but of course we are most interested in whether they were crossing in and out of the national park, like these two pictures. And it turns out that spotted hyenas are particularly adaptable to the fences because of how smart they are. So they're able to learn new tricks to get through the fences. And our cameras actually showed hyenas crossing in and out of the national park every single day. Um, so raise your hand if you've ever done any yoga or if your parents do any yoga. Hyenas actually do a little yoga too to get through the fences. As you can see here, I like to call it downward facing hyena. Now, remember when I told you that hyenas are very smart? Here's an example of what happens when you try to keep the hyenas and other animals from going in and out of the national park under the fence. And we think that they can almost always figure out how to get through again just like this guy does, um, kind of just move the boulders aside within the same night. But we wanted to know more. So since people are really dealing with hyenas threatening their livelihoods and hyenas are actually being poisoned by a lot of people, we wanted to see how these hyenas are moving through the landscape and near places where people live. So we worked with our Kenyan colleagues to put the GPS collars on the hyenas necks. Um, and since we can't see what hyenas are doing all the time because they're so clever, these collars actually help us to track their movements and see where they go. Um, so as you can see here, the collars are very thick and durable so that the hyenas with their powerful bites won't be able to destroy them easily. Um, and this collar I actually just took off of a hyena about three weeks ago because the battery ran out um, and it's still pretty sturdy, right? Nothing really has happened to it over three years of being on a hyena's neck. So just a heads up, this video I'm about to show you has a lot of raw cow meat in it, beef basically, but it's like a lot of beef. Uh, so close your eyes if you're squeamish. A lot of people say, oh wow, your job seems so glamorous and it just seems like it's the best job ever. It's actually really stinky sometimes. So this is uh, a bunch of rotting cow meat, rotting beef that I was given to use as bait for when I was capturing the hyenas a few weeks ago. And it's just hundreds of pounds of it that I was given by the way, I'm a vegetarian. So, um, you know, this job is definitely not glamorous. It can actually be pretty stinky. Um, so here's an example of what the GPS collar data look like. Um, this is just two days of information from our collars. And the collars actually use satellites to find out the animal's location, just like when you or your parents use Google Maps to get somewhere in the car. 
So for each animal, we get a location from the collar every five minutes, which is actually a lot of data. And we only take the locations at night since the hyenas are more active at night or nocturnal. Um, so as you can see, these hyenas are moving a lot. The blue one actually moves in and out of the national park every single day. So overall, in our study site, despite the threats and the negative perceptions that these animals are facing, we actually think that spotted hyenas are pretty good at adapting to humans on the landscape so far, um, but we're kind of studying that more. And we're gonna keep involving local communities to hear their perspectives about hyenas and hyena conservation over time. So we're coming to the end of the sciencey bit now. So I have to ask you all, raise your hand if you like hyenas. Hopefully I've changed some of your minds. Um, hopefully I've convinced some of you about how cool hyenas are, no matter what you see in the movies. Uh, and now raise your hand if you think that conservation is complicated, because I really threw a lot at you there. Um, so even if you never see a hyena in real life, there are so many other animals in our world that are misunderstood and have very complex conservation stories. Um, and there are just a few on this slide that I think are particularly misunderstood and interesting. And I guarantee you, you live near a misunderstood animal. Um, I actually am working in the Bay Area now, it's, uh, near San Francisco and around San Francisco with coyotes, which are uh, pictured on this slide, which are one of uh, the USA's most misunderstood animals. I'm kind of looking at how coyotes are interacting with people. Um, so what can you all do? I think it's really up to all of us to learn more about misunderstood animals and about how conservation of all species is really complex. There's not a simple answer. And that's what my work is all about. And my work is also all about working with local communities, um, as well as doing this fun ecology behavior work with animals to really understand the perspectives and fears that people who live with these animals have about them so that we can do a kind of more lasting conservation and empowering people. So really quickly, for those of you who are interested in becoming a carnivore ecologist, uh, I just wanted to share like who I am, where I came from. Um, and, you know, my path isn't really a straight line, as you can see here. Uh, it's This is just a, de a depiction. It's more like this. Um, but here we go. So I actually grew up in New York City, in Queens, New York, and I was always running around finding urban animals like cockroaches and cicadas and pigeons. This is me. This is me. Um, and I wanted to be like a nature show host, like on TV. Um, but I didn't really know how to do that. So I just knew I wanted to work with wildlife. I was visiting the zoo all the time. I was I would actually come to the kitchen table with uh, cicadas, this big insect all over my shirt. My mom really hated that, um, that kind of thing. And then I was applying to college undergraduate and I was trying to decide whether to keep with the wildlife idea or try to do acting or screenwriting or orchestra because I'm a musician. And what made my decision is I actually got a really great opportunity to work on an island off the coast of Maine and do marine science research and research on animals like seabirds. You can see some uh, seagulls or gulls as I call them in my hands there. Uh, and that really helped me to learn a lot about research and get a lot of nice opportunities to do research with animals. Um, and I also was able to study abroad in Kenya and Tanzania, which of course shaped my career immensely. This is me with some of the livestock that I work with in Kenya. Um, and a lot of, I made a lot of friends in East Africa and they were, a lot of them were dealing with conflict with wildlife. And they really asked me, you know, what tools can I use for this? And I felt unqualified to answer. Um, so that's why I ended up wanting to get those tools by doing a PhD, which is why I now have a doctorate. Um, and I also learned a lot there about how important it is to involve people in the research. Um, but before I went back to school, I wanted to gain some experience. So I lived in Uganda and I managed a primate conservation program working on primates and human primate conflict like chimpanzees. This is one of the chimpanzees that I know, um, as well as baboons and others. And of course, involving people. And so that's kind of where you should uh, think about you know, really, if you have someone you admire, reach out to them and ask them how you can get involved. That's how I got this opportunity. And then um, I wanted to do my PhD at Berkeley. So I wanted to move to San Francisco, but I'm also a taiko drummer. So I do have uh, additional parts of my life. Um, and that's a Japanese, you know, giant drumming style. And so I moved to San Francisco to join one of the first taiko drumming schools that ever happened in the continent. And then I started working at a museum called the California Academy of Sciences, working with people your age and also doing stuff like animal caretaking and doing stuff like building whale skeletons and all of that. And then I did my PhD um, here at UC Berkeley. Uh, and I wear a funny, we wear funny hats when we graduate from PhD. 
Um, and I did a lot of other fun things like starting Black Mammologist Week, which by the way is the first week of May and you all should um, get involved and do some of our activities when we do that. And also starting to work with people like National Geographic and Disney on um, some miniature TV shows and other sorts of things. Of course, getting back to my uh, dreams of being a nature show host. So this is me filming um, for a little show that I did with Disney about mammals. Um, so a lot of the stuff, of course, is very specific to me, but I'm happy to answer questions for those of you who are aspiring carnivore ecologists or um, you know nature fanatics. Please ask me any questions you have about my science or about my path. And I think we are ready for questions. All right, awesome. Well, Christine, thank you so much for that great uh, look into your research, into the misunderstood spotted hyena, just hyenas in general. Uh, but before we jump into a little Q&A action, I pulled together a quick little Kahoot quiz uh, behind the scenes for the students who are joining us. So I'm going to pop the link up right there. If you visit Kahoot.it, it's going to ask you for a PIN number. I shared that PIN number in the chat, but I'm also going to share my screen and you will see that PIN number come up shortly. Here we go. Perfect. So I see we already have some students joining. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now, uh, kahoot.it, and then the PIN number is 3045919. So we'll give another moment here to see if a few more students come and join us now that we're sharing uh, the PIN number directly on screen. If you're in your classroom with one-to-one -one tech, well, you can join right at your seat. If not, your teacher can pop it up at the front of the room. You guys can yell out your answers to him or her. The way it's going to roll, we will have 20 seconds for each question. If you get the answer right, you get some points. If you get it right and really fast, you get even more points. If you get it wrong, but you do it really fast, you still get a big goose egg, a big zero. So uh, a few more students trickling in, give it maybe 10 more seconds, and then we will take the quiz live. All right, here we go. First question is coming up. Let's see how we do. Our first question is, where was Christine doing her field work? Was she in Tanzania, in South Africa, in Kenya, uh, or in Botswana? Got 10 more seconds on the clock to get that answer in. All right, most students rolled with Kenya. Good job, crew. Let's take a look at our board. The Silly Eagle. Silly Eagle is in top spot, but only by a point. So anything can happen. Let's jump into a true and false question. Hyenas are more closely related to dogs than cats. Was that true or false? Hyenas are more closely related to dogs than cats. More seconds on the clock to get that in. All right, a big false on that one. We learned they're more closely related to the cats we have chilling, some of us in our living rooms or bedrooms at home. Let's jump to our leaderboard. Fast Duck has swept into the lead. We've got another quiz question coming up. Hyenas make the giggle sound when they feel angry, when they feel threatened, when they're bored or when they're sad. All right, good job crew. Most went with when they're feeling threatened. Let's see what that did to our leaderboard. Epic giraffe, we're having a lot of jumping around now. Let's see who's gonna be able to hold down this quiz. True and false, hyena are one of the few animals that can digest bone. Is that true or was that false? A couple more seconds on the clock. Most answers look like they're in. All right, that is very true, very cool. We saw that calcium uh, in the hyena droppings. Epic Giraffe is holding on. Will they go? Will they run it? What is the bite force of a hyena? Final question. Was it a thousand pounds per square inch? 
100 pounds per square inch, 5,000 pounds per square inch, or was it 15 pounds per square inch? That's one good looking hyena there. <laughs> All right, most went with a thousand, a really incredibly strong bite force, pretty amazing. How are we shaking out here on our podium? In third place, the genius zebra. In second, we've got the mountain squid and holding down that first place, fast duck sweeping back in from earlier, very cool. Well, good job, everyone. Thanks so much for getting a little interactive with us and joining in the quiz. Let's turn things over to a little Q&A action now. Uh, if you are joining via YouTube, don't forget to use that chat. Send us in some of your questions. Now is the time. Let's start bringing in some live classrooms. We'll start with Mr. Shattuck's crew joining us in Chalk River. How are we doing today? What is the most dangerous situation you've ever been in? It's a great question. Um, thanks for asking. I I think I've been in a lot of equally dangerous situations, um, but I was actually in one a few weeks ago. Um, we were looking for a hyena to remove a collar from, and he was being very, very um, shy and, and staying in the bushes. And I used um, a tracking device to try and find him with some guards, fortunately, who had weapons. Um, and we actually ended up coming across a buffalo, which is the most dangerous animal in Africa, actually a few buffalo. And we were unfortunately upwind from them, so we couldn't smell them. And we came, when we came across them around a bush, we were about six feet away from them. So like one tall person's body length away from a group of buffalo, which is very, very dangerous. And so the guard actually had to shoot his gun into the air to scare the buffalo away. No buffalo were harmed, um, but it was very, very frightening. And that's kind of you know, one of my worst fears is getting attacked by a buffalo. And that's happened, uh, similar things have happened to me a couple of times, but that was definitely one of the closest calls a couple of weeks ago. All right, great question. Definitely a close call. It's good, uh, probably good to have a team and not go out in the field uh, on your own. Very good, awesome, good question. Uh, okay, I see someone front and center. So I'm gonna bring this crew in next. I'm just gonna make sure I get the class right. So joining us in Cortice, we have some second and third graders hanging out with us. I'm going to bring them in now. Here they come. Hey, everyone. Hi. How do you, um, how do you not get hurt when you're working with hyenas? It's a great question. Um, so for the most part, aside from when we capture them, we actually try to stay in our car. Um, so I'll, I'll actually, those pictures at the den that I showed you, I drive up in my little car and I just watch them out of my car. And um, I make sure that I am not within, uh, you know, in any way that I could be like touched by them um, because they are, of course, wild animals, apex predators. Um, and when we capture them, which is the only time when we're doing something hands on. And of course, it's only as necessary because we do try to leave them alone for the most part. Um, we have a veterinarian who comes with me. And she uses a dart gun. So like has a little dart that comes out with a tranquilizer medicine in it. And when it hits the hyena, the hyena actually goes to sleep. So then you have about um, anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour with the sleeping hyena. And you can really easily see when it's about to, uh, you know, when it's about 20 minutes away from waking up, you can see its breathing change, kind of like how your breathing changes when you're sleeping versus when you're awake. Um, so we know that we can be very safe um, with them when they're sleeping. But otherwise, we do try to kind of give them a nice amount of space or observe them from our car. All right. And I'm sure there's other things you have to think about, too. Uh, not just the hyenas. Uh, equipment can break down. Probably all kinds of things you're thinking about. Being flexible and, and thinking about uh, what you would do in a different situation. I know expeditions don't always go as planned. You can plan as much as you want. but things happen. Oh, yeah. Side story about that. I actually was at a hyena den and hyena dens are, of course, holes in the ground um, that they repurpose from other animals. Uh, the night before I was leaving the field in Kenya this time, I finally, finally fell into a hole with my car, a giant hole and got stuck um, when I had very much other plans. <laughs> so I had to figure out who was going to pull the car out of the hole and all this stuff. So 
Um, and of course, we were like surrounded by hyenas, which was fine because we were in our car, but we couldn't do much about it and we needed help. So again, always good to have a team, have a backup plan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, let's bring in another classroom here with us. There we go. We've got some fifth and sixth graders hanging out with us today. They are from Mr. Falconer's crew. How are we doing today? Awesome. My question is, how long do hyenas live for? Yeah, hyenas, um, depending on whether they're in the wild or, or not, like, so we do have hyenas in zoos, right? Um, they can live anywhere from, like, I would say around 10 to 15 years in a zoo. They might live a shorter amount of time in the wild. Um, of course, I don't, I think the longest lived hyena was actually longer than, like, 13, 14, 15 years. Um but that's rare. You know, spotted hyenas face a lot of challenges in their life. Um, so when they're in the wild, they'll live a little bit less. However, this particular collar came off of a guy we call Smiley because he has like a ripped lip and his teeth are sticking out. And he is really quite old. Like we're estimating him to be somewhere around 10 years old and still going quite strong and even just joined a new clan and um, seems really healthy. So we'll see how long he lives. All right, so let's bring in another crew here. Mr. Botch's fourth graders are hanging out with us in Canada. How are we doing, fourth graders? Good thing. Um, are the collars uncomfortable for the hiatus? It's a great question. So we have a policy in the animal movement world where we make sure that all of the collars weigh less than 5% of the animal's body weight. So we want it to be light and not affect their behavior. And um, fortunately, there's been a good amount of studies, like there's a long-term hyena study that's been about 30 years now where they have collars that they've kind of tested, make sure that they're comfortable, nobody seems to be bothered. My main uh, concern about my collars was um, because it has this extra battery up here, I was concerned that my fence crossing hyenas might like get stuck, right? Like if you're going under a fence and this gets stuck, but that, that didn't seem to pose a problem. We put up cameras to see if they were all right. and. Um, they're actually fine and they don't face any weird, um, the other concern for animals would be like, oh, if the animal has something weird on it, do the other animals in its group treat it weird and like do something to that animal? The answer is no for hyenas. Um, and it's no for most carnivores too. Like they don't get treated differently by their clan or anything like that. Um, so as far as getting into the hyena's head and, and seeing like, okay, but like, is the collar how is the collar affecting you in any other way? Uh, we don't know how they feel about them, but we do know that they are not being hurt by them, and they're not. It's not changing their lifestyle. Um, that being said, it is really important to note that we prefer to use non-invasive techniques if possible. So things like the cameras, right? That don't have to. You don't have to touch the animal because um, if there's anything that we can do that involves a technique that's non-invasive, we would rather do it. But for certain things like monitoring and preventing conflict and looking at where they're moving, you do need to use these kind of invasive techniques. All right, great first round of questions. I'm gonna grab one from YouTube here. Sixth graders in Ottawa, Mrs. Lopa's crew, they're wondering, have you ever encountered a leader, like the, a leader hyena? Oh, a matriarch? Yeah. Yes. Um, I've encountered many, many matriarchs of hyena. So. All of the um, hyenas that are like the leaders are almost 100% of the time female. Um, if there's ever a male in charge, they usually don't last super long um, because the females are like the, the heads of the show. They're actually bigger than the males. Um, they have all sorts of things going for them that, are, that make them kind of the bosses. Um, and it's actually relatively easy to encounter the matriarchs because they tend to stick close to the den because they often have the most cubs, the cubs are the ones to get to drink milk first, eat pieces of meat first. Um, and so you're usually, and the females are actually usually less skittish and less shy. I call shy hyenas, shyenas. Um, there's more male shyenas than there are female shyenas. Um, so you'll see them more easily and you'll be able to observe them more easily than you will the, the guys. All right, shyenas, I like that. That's cool. You got to trademark that name. Uh, all right, uh, we're going to do a lightning round. We'll visit a, a few more classrooms and we'll work in some questions. I'm going to go out of order this time, so uh, be ready. Who knows where we're going to go? Let's start with Good Shepherd, second, third graders. Go ahead. 
What do you think is the most misunderstood animal you researched? Most misunderstood animal I've ever researched uh, is definitely the hyena. But I gotta say, um, a lot of the animals that are in like urban places, like cities, are also really misunderstood. So, you know, think about um, coyotes, which I work on. I've worked on rats. I've worked on gulls, right? Like people think of gulls as like trash birds, um, raccoons. And what do all of those animals have in common? Um, most of our misunderstood animals are actually animals that we come into contact with and they annoy us more. And the thing about those animals is that they're usually more adaptable than all the other animals. So they're able to adapt to what humans are doing to the landscape and to their habitat. And that means things like coming in and eating your cow or coming in and um, you know eating your cat if you're a coyote in the city. And those are things that people really don't like, um, those adaptations. So that's why they're kind of vilified and they're maybe killed and that kind of thing. Um, so it is, it's no coincidence that, that I work with these animals. I'm doing it on purpose. <laughs> All right, great question. Uh, where are we going now? Let's go to Second Street. Second Street five sixes. Do you guys have another question? Um, how many hyenas have you caught? Um, so we have caught for the collaring um, seven. We collared seven, representing five out of the six hyena clans in the places where I work. So kind of having a representative or two from each clan. Um, and the reason that we did that was to try and like minimize our impact on the clan, like rather than coloring a lot of them in one clan. And also just logistically, you know, these are um, where I work is really developed. And there are a lot of um, interactions with people and they're not always good ones. So like I even had a collared hyena get poisoned um, and we had to recover the collar. So these hyenas, a lot of them are shy hyenas, um, especially in the conservancy across the street from the national park. Um, so they're harder to catch. So I was trying to kind of optimize, how can I catch them without um, kind of making them even more afraid of our cars and things like that? Um, Cause they're already super shy. All right, another great question. Let's go, Mr. Botcha's fourth graders. You guys have another question? We do. Ooh, right at the bell. <laughs> do hyenas come into conflicts with lions? Yes, they do. They are competitors, actually. Um, I've seen a really interesting picture of a hyena carrying a lion's head in its mouth um, that it had, it was eating. Um, and, and lions will come and try to, you know, kill hyena cubs and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there have been really epic lion hyena battles that have been captured on camera. I'm sure you can um, ask your parents to help you find some videos of that because um, they are both apex predators. So they are competing with each other. All right, cool question. And then we did see that picture. I had a picture up in the cahoots with a lion running from a, a, a group of hyenas. Definitely strength in numbers. Uh, Mr. Shaddix crew, do you guys wanna take us home with a final question? Um, what is your favorite hyena and why? That's a great question. Um, there was a hyena that I haven't seen him in a minute and I, and he might not be with us anymore. And he was one of my favorites because I called him Mikey. Um, and he had a snare. So like there's wire snares that people use to catch um, game for meat. It's illegal in Kenya, but it's legal in other places. Um, so like they, they're trying to catch things like gazelles and all of that for meat but the hyenas get stuck in those a lot. So Mikey had a snare around his neck and a snare around his paw. So he was walking on three paws and he had the snare on his neck and he was still like doing well. Like he was, I mean, we tried to catch him a few times to de-snare him, but we couldn't get him. Um, and, but he was still crossing that fence and like really like trying to thrive despite having these snares. And he's not the only one. So a lot of these animals, um, these hyenas are so resilient um, to these threats that they can really, really push through and like, like heal from really, really amazing things. So for me, Mikey will always have like a soft spot in my heart because he was sort of the most snared hyena that I saw, but he was still figuring out how to thrive. All right. That's awesome. So Christine, uh, one more question from the chat and this is, um, we've connected with uh, Tanyue Mwitwa a few times, and she's talked about working with the lions, and she's had an experience where a lion started waking up early while they were still working and getting the collar fitted. 
Uh, so someone in the chat is wondering, has an experience like that ever happened where maybe the dose was a little bit off and the hyena was waking up while you were working? Um, I haven't had that, but I have had a situation just recently where the hyena would not go to sleep. So he was kind of going to sleep, but he was really running through the bushes and like, like stopping and resting and then running. And it was at like 11 PM in a very, very Buffalo dense place. And so we were all like trying to give him space, but trying to follow him enough that we could catch him when he goes down, but also not trying to get killed by Buffalo. And also it was nighttime and there's thorns everywhere. Um, and so he just would not go down. Um, and that, and that guy, by the way, was so inspiring because he, when we caught him, it turns out not only did he have a collar, his collar we needed to get off, he had a giant head wound almost all the way down to the bone that was fresh. Wow. And like, and it was, it was actually starting to rot. So we were able to help him out, but like first we had to catch the dude who just like, he was like a tank. He would not go down. So that's, fortunately we haven't had anybody waking up, but we have had um, issues where we had to, you know, with that guy, we kind of had to pin him and make sure he got just an additional dose, even though he got the right dose. He just was like a tank. Amazing. Crazy. Uh, well, uh, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our YouTube classrooms. Thank you for joining us, playing along with the Kahoot. Thank you to our camera classrooms. There's a few of them. One had to duck out for recess. We'll pop a few of them in so they can give a big goodbye, a big thank you there. Thanks, everybody. Oh, a big whoop, no? One more whoop. Let's hear it. Perfect. And Christine, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Uh, first of all, shedding some light on hyenas and busting some of those myths that, you know, that we do have. And the conservation work, working with the communities, trying to find a way where humans, carnivores, they can interact, they can coexist. It's uh, great work you're doing and cool use of technology and mapping. Awesome. Thanks, Joe, for having me. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Awesome. Well, we're going to sign out for today. Again, thanks so much, everybody. For now, we are signing off. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>